You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the BH app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Whites. Greetings and welcome to the BH Photography Gear Cast. Today we are introducing not one but two new features to our show. The first is the show itself. Today's show is going to be a gear cast. Starting today and continuing once a month moving forward, we will be recording an episode devoted entirely to new cameras, new lenses, and related gear. The second thing we're springing on you today is a new segment called, for lack of better judgment, Al's Gearhead Pick of the Week. In every episode, we're going to talk about a new camera, a new lens, or other photo-related doodad that's piqued our interest. We'd be curious to hear what you think of our new initiatives. Hashtag it, BH Gearcast on Twitter, and in all sincerity, subscribe to our show on iTunes. And while you're there, leave us a review. We do read them, and they do help us formulate our show. In today's inaugural B&H Photography Gearcast, we will be talking about third-party lenses, what defines a third-party lens, what are their advantages, disadvantages, and who's making what. Joining us is the inimitable and always adorable Lady Tenenbaum, a trainer and product specialist here at B&H, a frequent guest guest on the show, and a photographer in his own right. Let's start today's gear cast with our gear pick of the week. Actually, two picks of the week because I couldn't narrow it down to one. The first is a Nikon 70 to 200 f 2.8 E-F-L-E-D-V-R. That's their latest 70 to 200 uh, zoom lens. I had an opportunity to use it. And I actually not only used it, I used its predecessor. The big difference, there's an updated optical formula. It is a sharper lens, a significantly sharper around the corners. Uh, if you look at the lens itself, it has four autofocus lock buttons going around the barrel, which is nice. You could freeze your focus at any point in time. And interestingly enough, they reversed the zoom and focus rings uh, uh, from where it was traditionally. And I happen to prefer the older, but maybe that's because I'm used to the older style. But the new lens is really, they both perform beautifully. The new lens is is a better lens as far as sharpness. And a bit lighter too, right? Uh, it's a hair. And actually, okay. it's a hair lighter, but it has more lens elements in it, uh -huh. which is kind of interesting. Yeah. But the size is pretty much the same. And I think the, um, uh, the hood is better. It's got less deep cutouts on it, or shallower cutouts. Well, it, it, it focused... The the autofocus was super smooth, and this yeah. is obviously you know a workhorse lens for a lot of people, so it'll be a big deal. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Obviously, the price has gone up a little bit too. It's uh, about six hundred dollars more than its predecessor, mm -hmm. but if you need what it got, then it's worth getting. Mm -hmm. The other big news is Kodak Ektachrome. After being discontinued back in two thousand and twelve, Kodak has announced they're bringing back Ektachrome one hundred. That's transparency slide film, which is really terrific. It's a beautiful fine grain film. Uh, they'll be making it for still cameras and cinematography, and it will be out sometime around the end of 2017. I look forward to it. Should we start on third-party lenses, the yeah, topic of today? Um, I think we've all had experience with them. I, I know I own lenses from like four different companies for the cameras that I've been using. Um, I've it's interesting how they've come along, and I think a lot of it has to do with the with the oncoming of mirrorless cameras. All of a sudden, people I think are more open to going to camera to lenses other than the ones made by the camera manufacturer they own. Uh, I know most Nikon owners, that's it; they live with Nikon, and most Canon owners go for a Canon. La da da da. Now people are mixing and mashing stuff all over the place, and there's some really good lenses out there. Some real, real good stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's just jump back to def make a, a simple definition. I mean, obviously, they're lenses that are not from the camera manufacturer that they're used on, correct? Simple yes. enough? Yes. But also, for the sake of this, they're not lenses that you need an adapter to use on that camera body. It depends on the manufacturer. Some of them make them with fixed mounts for dedicated camera. Right. That's the general idea of what we're and talking about And then they today, also right? might make oh, like what they use, a T-mount or not, some kind of other interchange. But that's right. not really the right. big thing anymore at all. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, we're talking about lenses that are made by a, not, not one of the major manufacturers of cameras. Usually the companies don't make cameras, although in the case of Sigma, they do. Right. I don't um, think that they're considered a major, major manufacturer of cameras. True. Don't tell true. them that, uh, though. <laughs> Whatever you do. And, uh, es essentially, it, it's, yeah. it's but not... But they have uh, the mount of that, yeah. of that camera manufacturer. All right. So the advantages of it? 
you have choices because some t- one of, one of the things about uh, that I think attracted me early on to a lot of the third party was the fact that some of these companies like Sigma and and, and other co- companies made lenses that. Nikon, Sony, Canon didn't manufacture it. Might have been faster, different zoom range, focal lengths, whatever. Um, and you know, and they were also less expensive. Yeah, often, always, always, not always, well, not, no, always. not always. No, no, it, no that's true. That's now true. you can't say it anymore yeah. because now they're making lenses yeah, like that are pricey, of, yeah. but compared to the comparable ones from the major manufacturers, they're not so expensive. We've mentioned this before, but one of the ones who makes what I would really call like a premium lens at this point is Sigma. Because Sigma's making some really amazing lenses right now. They're putting out some very interesting vocal lengths, starting off with the 18 to, yeah. to 35 1.8 for APC, 50 to 100, the 150 to 500, which we can all agree is you get what you get. But it's they're interesting. They're interesting focal lengths. But in even the premium, fast wide zooms in the art series. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And what's what's really interesting, is particularly in their art series, is where the main brands seem to be trying to cut as much weight as possible. And trying to go either more plastics or like composites, Sigma has been kind of dedicated to putting out a big, strong, robust lens. And so when you pick up a Sigma lens, even though you've spent anywhere between five hundred and three hundred dollars less than the manufacturer product, you feel like you're picking up a real lens. Quality piece. It used to be that with a lot of these lenses, if you bought them, you knew that one of the compromises was that you're going to be replacing it. A lot sooner than later. Oh, I did that with my first couple of lenses. Oh, sure. But the new art lenses and, and the few other manufacturers making lenses comparable to that of that quality, they're going to outlast your next few cameras. It's kind of a reverse. Yep. Some, some of and those it's Sigma, less money. Those Sigma Primes, those art series, they're not bargain basement. They're, no. They're kind of pricey. I no. mean, they're, I'm sure, fairly priced, but... Uh, they're still priced less than the comparable lenses well, have, from their main I mean, you have the Sigma 50 F1.4 is going for 950 yeah, uh, the Nikon fifty f one four G five hundred, um, Canon f one two of course is up to thirteen hundred. That's a different story though. You know, well, yeah, yeah you're but, paying yeah. for the speed there. Also, when you look at it, though, the the Sigma fifty millimeter one four, I'd say is more comparable to what Nikon's doing with the thirty five millimeter one four mm-hmm. than the fifty one four G. Yeah, yeah, that G's. Yeah. So when you look at when you look at the thirty five, if Nikon made a a fifty millimeter version of that. Mm-hmm. Thirty-five. Then, then be I think you'd be looking at like fifteen hundred. You think? Yeah. 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 Oh no! What am I saying? Nikon has a fifty-eight. The fifty-eight one four. It's actually a really nice lens. Oh, that's a pricey one though. Yeah, yeah, but that's and that's that's exactly what I'm talking about though. Mm-hmm. What are some of the disadvantages? Let's go there. There I mean, have been issues with electronic compatibility. Absolutely. I know with a few manufacturers because yeah. what happens is the camera manufacturer will update the firmware, but the lens manufacturer has to play catch up. So mm-hmm. sometimes there have been things, serious focusing issues, and I think even at times exposure. I won't square that, but I know focus is a big deal. No, there are there were, there were definitely exposure issues. Um, the thing to keep in mind is like this: is that if you're buying a dummy lens, which is your basic standard all manual everything, then you don't really have anything to worry about, particularly if the dummy lens is is aperture control as well in the lens. Right. Mm-hmm. So you pretty much have no issues as long as it mounts to the camera body. Right. Right? And even then, even if it doesn't mount to the camera body, you could still do th- something called lens whacking, which is when you kind of just insert the lens if it fits inside and just kind of hold it in place and it makes for some interesting light leaks. <laughs> very artsy, very interesting. <laughs> Um, but that's, I don't think that's, that's not the first thing you want to do on assignment. Right. But. That's not, <laughs> <laughs> Helen, out of all people in the world, I thought you'd be the first person to do that on an assignment. <laughs> um, Even but, though I have my standards. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Even now, really? <laughs> well, okay, maybe not. Okay. <laughs> um, but I don't, I don't think that that's what we're talking about. We're talking about as lenses that will actually insert and fit properly into, into, so that part over there being that the camera manufacturers like Nikon's have been since the 50s with the same F mount and Canon, even though they switched over to EF, um, they've been kind of going strong with with that mount. Everyone's kind of been in with their same consistent mount. So the mounts, if you have a dummy lens, is very easy to work with because even if you change the firmware, the camera still clicks when you tell it right. to click. The, the challenge comes with when you want to do an autofocus and fully electronically controlled lens. Right. And to my understanding, all these third-party manufacturers are reverse engineering Yes. The, the system. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah, just like when they release an update and they tweaked it for one of the, a, a Canon lens, let's say that wasn't performing as well, and Canon releases an update to say, hey, here's how we can make our lenses work better. And then Sigma goes, holy crud, they changed the code of the autofocus. Now we need to change something in, in our stuff and then release an update also. Yeah. And that's when you get into trouble. 
Yeah. I mean, I know with the, the Sigma that I use, which is a generation or two back, it autofocuses, but it doesn't do it the way, you know, the proprietary yeah. lens does. The new, the new stuff works a lot better. And it, all, it also, well, it goes camera to camera too. Right. I mean, you know, as the camera. Well, updated. we had a couple of the art lenses here, the 35s and the 50s. I think we're actually from the, the library. And uh, was using, and I was impressed with the response time and the resolving power. Yeah. Yeah. Real yeah. sharp. Well, yeah. it's not just Sigma too. I mean, Tokina and yeah, 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 also, yeah, yeah. you know, picking up that and running with it too. They're making improved lenses. And, uh, and I guess it is fair to say that a lot of it has to do with mirrorless, although these are lenses for DSLR we're mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you about the... Uh, the reverse engineering, what about Zeiss and their relationship with Sony? Are they kind of working hand in hand or are they also just kind of making things that So I don't I don't know enough. I I don't know. Just curious about one thing with the, have you noticed any color differences because Zeiss lenses like Leica lens, they they go for neutral color. Their coatings are made to get neutral, neutral, neutral. Do you notice a difference between the uh, Zeiss lenses for Sony and the Sony lenses as far as are the Sony brands a little poppier? To I've me, never compared. To me, to me, I haven't done a one to one yet, but to me, Zeiss has always leaned a toward a little bit cooler. Yeah, yeah. In, in 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 color, whereas Sony tends to lean a little bit more warm, and that's that's kind of my kind of my take on it. Like for me. Zeiss is kind of what I'd use to photograph if I weren't doing like a ton of color correction, or even if I was, um, I would use it to photograph or film um, something which had like a futuristic kind of feel, something that I wanted to be like sharp and like razor difference between where it's in focus and out of focus. That's kind of my my feeling with, with the Zeiss lenses, whereas the Sony lenses, they have that kind of same kind of like razor fall off, but they seem to be a little bit warmer in the highlights, mm -hmm. I want to say. And that to me is is less color correction than I have to do because it's already built into the way it's being shot. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Um, I know in some of the experience I've had with, with third-party <clears throat> lenses, usually, the, you know, yeah, you may have some problems around the edges. There may be, there can be. I mean, of course, we're going to talk about lenses up and down the price range. But ones that are from the major third-party lenses that I've used, uh, it's the imaging is not really the issue. It, it comes down to sometimes their durability, you know, yeah, some of the yep. little things, some of the knobs might fall off. Some, you know, yeah, it's going to be a little crunchy when you're adjusting focus manually. Yeah, so when, uh, can I, if like, I could yeah. jump in here real quick, um, I'm really glad you're bringing that up because we're not really talking about that. So when we talk about third-party lenses, there's premium third-party lenses, which right. is the stuff we've been talking about right now, like the the Sigma um, Art, the the Tamron VCDIs, the the Firon the, the, lenses the, the, the from the Tokina, Firing from Tokina, the certainly the Zeiss. I mean. Um, and, uh, yeah. The Zeiss, any of the Zeiss lenses, Loxia. There are also a whole bunch of lenses that notice. cost under two hundred dollars or even a hundred dollars. We're going to get into those. And we're going to get to that stuff, yeah. right? And that and, th and that's I think the big differentiator because when we're talking about those type of lenses, that's usually where you find a lot more issues and problems because they're really trying to deliver a budget solution. Yep. And you find a lot less sharpness on the edges, a lot, you a know, little more wobble in the barrel. And that's because you're paying two hundred bucks instead of four hundred bucks from the manufacturer's version of that same type of economy lens. I, I once had somebody explain to me what the real difference is, often what the difference is between the real low price lenses and what, according to the specs, seems like the same lens, but it costs hundred dollars or more. And that is with the better lens, the the focusing helicoid and all of the components have much finer tooling to them. Uh, uh, smaller, you know, threads, finer threads for smoothness, whereas the less expensive lens will have coarser threads and thicker grease. Right. And what happens is out of the box, and this is true, out of the box, they feel terrific, right. but if they go through one or two seasons of hot, cold, whatever, or just mm -hmm. use, the lubricants start gumming up, and that's when you get the wobble and everything else that goes on to it. So it could be sharp, but it could be a disaster to actually use after a while, and just annoying. Right. What do you guys know about, like, for example... Uh, Internal focusing and internal zoom compared to external zoom because I, I, it seems that you external know, zoom is cheaper to manufacture, they, which exactly. is why you find it that way, right. and it's a nuisance. Yeah, you know because it, uh, it the, the lens keeps changing size. You scare somebody sometimes. You <laughs> zoom in <laughs> on them, um, and also they're inv invariably variable shut uh, aperture lenses, which means the f stops are not constant right. and noisier and noisier. Yeah, and they get a little bit of clunky after a while. Yep. What about like, let's say you're you're setting up your system, uh, your Canon Nikon shooter, and you know you have to budget. You have to decide what you're going to buy, where you're going to allocate what you what we what your money you have. So you're going to want to buy, per perhaps you know one of an L series Canon lens or a high end Nikon lens, and then you may want to spread your you know your funds around. 
Any thoughts on that? Like where you might want to go with, I mean, for me, you like, know, 24, we, 70, we, 70, we 200. Something, yeah. Can we give something a little clear? Like what, what's I'll the give you a good doing? example what, of what kind oh, of photography. He, 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 here's okay. an example. Yeah. I, I got a great example. Say you do general shooting, but every once in a while you have to do something, say with architecture, where it needs some kind of perspective control. You can buy a tilt shift lens from Nikon, Canon, and, mm -hmm. or, or other manufacturers and spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And they're great 2000 lenses. 2000 for a 24. Let's yeah. Say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you can buy one of the tilt shifts from, say, uh, Sanyang or Rokinon, which are $800. $800, yep. and they're very sharp. They're yep. not made quite the same way, but I've shot side by side. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, your pictures are great. Now, if I'm shooting all the time and I'm using it constantly, I'm going to buy the better lens because I know it'll last longer. But if it's the kind of thing where it's an occasional use, save your money, get good pictures, and you'll be using that same lens for a long time. Mm -hmm. Another thing is if you're, you know, if you're a landscape shooter and you don't need autofocus. Uh-huh. You know, why go there? You know, exactly. Right, you know, which, 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 which is where we have these these manufacturers out of Korea, Samyang, Rokinon, Bauer, Optech are all pretty much made out of the same factory. Um, and John brought up a good point that like if you're doing landscape or something like that where you don't need autofocus really fast, that's where these lenses really shine. Like we're seeing them very popular in video mm -hmm. because people who are shooting video until recently, there hasn't really been good autofocus for video. So being able to just control the manual focus at a price drop of 800 or even thousands of dollars if you're going to go up to like proper cinema lenses those are great exchange if you were shooting if you were shooting landscape or or such as long as you had the resolving power that you needed these were great lenses and at a very decent price mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. or on the other side you know for long for long telephoto lenses if you're you know someone who let's say twice a year you're going to go out into the woods and shoot birds or whatever you may want to look to the Sigma long lens or mm -hmm. Tokina, who was kind of well known for that at a certain point, uh, as opposed to like on Canon, where you're gonna you're gonna save a thousand dollars easy, right? Right. Well, depending depending what lens you're going for, Sigma makes some interesting, like a one twenty to three hundred. Um, uh -huh. They make they make some interesting lenses. Um, I I would almost caution someone to say like if you're only going out once or twice a year, and you're going to photograph birds, rent the big lens. Yeah. That's, that's a good that's point. A, yeah. Actually, that's a point we were going to talk about in general, you know, test, you know, rent, you know, test by renting, you know, yeah. that's yep. not a bad idea. There, there's some great websites out there right now that are really very helpful to someone who's kind of looking. It's worth the, I, I want to call it like lesser investment, even if it costs you a couple hundred bucks to rent a lens, particularly if you're looking to buy any of these $1,500 and up type of lenses, right. particularly if you're looking for a big lens, because that's right. easily going to start costing you three, four K. Can I just we're talking about price, and you know, I think really it does get down to price. I mean, now there are options, and there's a whole bunch of reasons, but in general, I think the discussion you know goes around price versus quality. Tam, I'm, here's seventy to two hundred. Your Tamron seventy two hundred two eight is fifteen hundred. Sigma twelve hundred. Canon nineteen hundred, and the new Nikon is twenty eight hundred. So right. you were, you're seeing some. What did you say for Canon? Canon's like twenty two hundred, I think, for the new one, right? I had nineteen for the one that I saw. I, th I think it's always on. I think we always have it on like a discount. Oh yeah, yeah okay. It's, there's a twenty two. Yeah, you know, well, it's another interesting thing. Um, in fact, Jason and I were talking about this the other day with uh, wide angle lenses. But for the longest time, people who shot APS-C and, and micro four thirds, they were compromised for wide angle. But what I found is interesting with the new set, a, a lot of the Rokinon yeah, and Sanyang, yeah. they make some really nice extreme ultra wides. Now, they're very sharp. The problem I had with them shooting on a full frame camera is that the edges do get more distorted than some of the major brands like a Nikon or a Canon, not only, you know, pin cushion, but like mustache distortions. Now, if you're shooting APS-C, that part's cropped out, and what yep. you have is this sweet spot that is still really wide angle. So that's a great use for those lenses. If you have APS-C, look at these because they're not expensive. They're, they're manual focused, but you get great picks from that, them. That's a great point, and I think a really important point is that a lot of a lot of these lenses might be made for full frame, but they'll still fit onto an APS-C sensor. Yeah. And then if you and might understand, even be better. Right, exactly, because you're maximizing the center where generally the third-party lenses aren't terrible in the center. They're going to be terrible toward the outers. And, and when I'm saying third-party over here, I want to correct it a little bit. I want to say third-party budget lenses because the higher-end third-party... Third yeah. yeah. when, we, when we come back, we're going we're to kind of break down the different price points and quality. We're going to kind of give a list, but yeah, it is good to differentiate. I, I think that's yeah. really important, because particularly nowadays, because back in the day, I think... Well, well, I guess we'll talk about it, but yeah. I think back in the day, Zeiss was like the only one. Now we have a lot of very interesting oh, manufacturers. Yeah. Well, let's jump to this nice idea stuff. of mirrorless, which we talked about briefly, but I mean, it seems to me that 
you know, with the, the creation of, of mirrorless cameras, there was a, a vacuum, you know, that got filled quickly by Rokinone and, and now Zeiss and others because the, the manufacturers hadn't caught up with their lens systems. And uh, I think mirrorless opened up a very interesting possibility. And um, we really saw this in the video world. The video world had kind of like one mount, they have a PL mount, and then every manufacturer makes for positive lock. Mm -hmm. And so you can get a bunch of different lenses. Then it all depends on sensor size, whether or not your lenses could fit. So you'd have four by three anamorphic or 16 by nine, whatever you were doing, you'd figure out what lenses would fit it, right? Great. In in photo, we've been so used to being locked into EF mount or, or F mount and because everything was autofocus. Earlier, I don't even think we were recording at the time when Alan was talking about when you had like these T, T mount lenses and mm -hmm. stuff like that. This is something that was already going on, just I don't think it was as popular. As soon as adapters started coming out and you realized that, hey, I can mount a Canon lens on my Sony camera or a Nikon lens on my Sony camera, it opened up the possibility to be like, hey, what other lenses can I open up? And people started digging through their Oh, their yeah, when I look at lenses on, on, here in the story or wherever it is, the manufacturer's second. I'm looking for interesting lenses, good lenses, and if they're good, I know I could adapt them to my mirrorless camera. Exactly. That to me is wonderful. That's another thing. Well, also, you mentioned with the T-mounts. Back in the day when a lot of these original manufacturers, Sologarb, uh, Vivitar, Tamron, all came out initially, they were known specifically and only for budget and I don't even know if they had fixed mounts back then. It was all T-mounts. You bought the lens and then you bought the adapter right. to put it onto your Canon, Nikon, Pentax, and they invariably were wobbly. They never yeah, yep. good. So yeah. you knew that you knew what you're going into, but now they're still kind of catering to that end of the market in, I think, in better form, but they're also catering to the high end of the market, which is good for everybody. <laughs> well, we were talking yesterday about the Adaptal system, yes. remember from the 70s, which was a Tamron thing, and they would... Uh, you would get the lens and you would it would come with three or four different mounts. Yes. And you could put it onto it and change that if you want to go back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Sigma Sigma will actually do that for you. Well Sigma if will you, change the mounts. Yeah, yeah you we'll can send it back mount. and they'll change your mount. Yeah. yeah. But they'll will I mean well they won't change it from a Nikon to a Canon, will they? They'll change it from a is Sigma it, to a you know, Nikon. Sigma I, to something else. I, I'm I think, not sure. I'm not sure either. The other interesting thing to point out is that um, with all these lenses, nowadays there's so many people who own the same premium lens. I own a 2470. John Harris owns a 2470. Alan owns a 2470. No, I don't. Well, mm. I, I don't know when I do. I'm I don't. Saying, I I'm swore them off. Alan the, doesn't, the but Al does. Right, okay. Al does. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone, everyone's shooting with the same Canon 24 to 70 version too. And at a certain point, all the shots start to look the same. I mean, you can see this when you're on Flickr. You can see this when, when, all, when you're on all the sites. You're seeing like, hey, the focal length looks exactly the same. The shot looks exactly the same. It's retouched the same way. And what's starting to happen is people are pulling out specialty lenses or slightly off-brand lenses because they're getting a slightly different look. Yeah, it's a different signature. Absolutely. And my, my example for this is I had one of the 51.8 thrifty fifties like original from canon like the one which if you shot for it with too long it was known for like the front lens element to kind of pop off <laughs> yeah. and that lens was terribly not sharp on the i mean we're talking like almost like smooth but i loved the look it gave me it gave me this super soft look on the outside and even though i shot with the 51 2 i shot with the 51 4 i would always go back to that 51 8 because it's just like no one else is getting this look and i can get this look where the eyes are in focus and the forehead is not in focus and it's not a tilt shift lens <laughs> Yeah. So that's, that's yeah. I think, what's happening. And we're seeing some interesting stuff coming out from manufacturers. One of the ones I really want to point out is the, I think it's the Venus Optics 15 yeah. millimeter macro, which I think I, I sent John this an email. Like, this is like awesome. A 15 millimeter, a wide angle macro lens. Like, that is awesome. None of the regular companies are making that. No one even in. Mm, kind of. Yeah. Who makes I've it? been doing it. <laughs> I have a Voigtlander 12 millimeter and 15 millimeter, and yes. I put them on the VME adapter yep. on my Sony, and now I have macro focusing. Yep. But it costs a lot more than that, but I could also macro focus with any M mount lens I put on the camera. But yeah, no, that is a great lens, and it takes great pictures, and it's priced well. And it's built, and it's built into the lens instead of an adapter. Yes. Well, you're talking about the 5050, and I think that has a new definition now with the Young Nyo. Young Nyo. $50. Uh, that, that, that is 50 50 <laughs> That is perfect, actually. Um, 50 for 50 and The other thing I want to <laughs> mention quickly were reflex uh, catatidopt. I'm sorry, I'm bad on this. KD, Kadioptric. Kadioptric. So I have it written Mirrored down here somewhere because I can know, never say it. The ultra telephotos that are, you know, look like a can of... Catadioptric. Uh, we're we talking about like mirror That's lenses? A mirror lens. Mirror lenses, yep. yeah. Short telephotos. Popular, and a really, I mean, a real budget option. If that is you a real budget option. You know, ultra telephoto. 
Yeah, you find you find those a lot for like really interesting things like stable stuff because they don't autofocus. They're a fix, fixed f eight usually, and they are like they're not super great. But I mean, you're gonna get eight hundred millimeters f four for like or f eight for like what yeah. is it, a couple hundred bucks? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I've owned a few over the years, and every once in a while, I hit a picture that is just solid with it, and they're. Yeah, they're they're, they're another think, story. I, th- I think they use a lot for like astral photography, like yes. you know, really photographing like the moon or the big or problem like that. is that it turns instead of bokeh, you you get a, like these donuts. Right, that's, like, <laughs> that's what exactly. they, they call them donuts, yeah. and it looks yeah. like a whole these circles all yeah. over the place. So let's take a break, and uh, we'll come back and talk. Uh, we'll go through the list. Like the man says, we're going to take a break and come back for the list. <laughs> Yes, master. <laughs> I will do as you say. Shut up. Okay. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the BH Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. Before we go through a list of who makes what, you know, something I think is really important to, to note, and that goes for all lenses is that if you were to go into uh, the store or go to the factory and pull a half a dozen samples randomly and actually bench test them, they're not the same. Yep. It's the same thing with cameras, the meters. There's like, there's like 20% slop allowed, plus and minus. And lenses have their tolerances. They have to be sharp. They have to hit certain standards. But if you pull out a half a dozen random lenses, you're going to find one or two that are going to be notably better and maybe one or two that are really bad. Especially the to- when you're the dealing with, I don't are know. Different. I don't know if, you, if the use of polymers increases or decreases that. I don't know if, if if a lot of these composite materials are actually more precision in a certain sense as far as measurements than their aluminum or brass or alloy counterparts. We've I got to get know. an engineer in here one time, like mm-hmm. one of the like lens engineers from Absolutely. from someone. Yeah. That yeah. is something we've been working on. Um, I know what was mentioned earlier, but it, I'd like to reemphasize: you're going to find some focal lengths by these third-party manufacturers that you're not going to find from the majors. And uh, that's another great advantage. I mean, you know, especially if you're you're really building up your collection of lenses or you have a specific need, you know, they're out there for you. Sometimes you have no choice. if They make something that no one else does. That or you just, or or right now I'm finding that people want something just slightly different. Yep. Just to try even. Or Or like you said, to get a different look that everybody else has. All right, so let's start with... um, Let's start at the bottom, right? Okay. The <laughs> least expensive lenses we have here, uh, and now I'm, I'm going to attempt this pronunciation, Young Yao? Yeah, I think in English we call it Young Nuo, but I think the pr- proper pronunciation is something Young Yao. Young Yao. Okay. Young Yao. You, please forgive us. If and if anyone here speaks Chinese, please let us know. Yeah. It's Y-O-N-G-N-U-O, and they make lenses uh, uh, in Canon and Nikon mounts. They're manufactured in China, um, and they have a 35 f2. For ninety three dollars, and a fifty millimeter one eight for forty nine ninety five. That's a buck a millimeter, and th- these are prices <laughs> from our website, by the way. So, really, come on, it doesn't get better than that. Um, and if you look at, them, they look like knockoffs of of the you know the the, lens, the basic basic cheapy lenses from Nikon and Canon. Their most basic lenses. These are knockoffs of them, and. They may or may not be good. We have not used them yet. There's also the optic. The reviews. The reviews are actually really good on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, the reviews are really good. And what about Mitakan Zongkai? Mitakai Shungi? Yeah. I think it's, again, if someone here really knows how these are pronounced, please yeah. send those in. <laughs> yeah, we're butchering it. There's no doubt. With a voice note. Yeah. We apologize. We should broadcast from the UN next time. We can grab somebody. <laughs> just, um, those, well, we have some people here. Like, we actually do. It's, it's very true here. They also make uh, um, turbo adapters. That's another thing that they do. Um, what's interesting about their lenses, I found, they all have 9 to 12 aperture blades. They're all metal construction, and they make them for Canon, Nikon, Pentax, Sony A. Uh, they have a 35 F2 for 160, a 2417 for APS-C for 349. They also make some hefty stuff. They make a 50 0.95, 0.95 for $700, and an 85-1-2 Speedmaster for $799. Um, a 135 1.4 for 16.98. Now that's pretty impressive, and they also make the goofiest lens we've seen here in years. That's that 20 millimeter uh, f um, that macro thing. That yeah. macro with a 4.5 
X Super Macro, the one that you can get arrested for <laughs> if you try using it in the streets. It's one hundred ninety nine dollars, and it is a conversation piece. That, well, that, that's that's the one that looks like a long lens. antenna. It's yeah. the yeah. one that grows like a snail snout. It's really scary. <laughs> that thing. It is the creepiest looking lens I've ever seen in my life. You ever see snails? They put those little, little extenders out there. It looks like an yeah. a, an alien probe. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what it looks like. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. This will be in the next or Star or, Wars or, film. or 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 a baton. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, th- th- those are kind of interesting. And what about I- SLR Magic, it's pretty. SLR affordable. Magic's also got some really interesting stuff going on. They got. They also have a pretty decent name for what for what they're delivering. Mm-hmm. Um, we sell a couple of them, I believe. A fifty one one. Yeah. Oh, these are cine. These are cine lenses, though. No. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, they they make other things Venus too. Venus optics. And- they're not that cheap, but they also have the we uh, again a nice interesting. Set of focal lengths. Yeah, so a lot, a lot of these companies, it seems to me at least, um, some of them I have not been able to get my hands on yet, and we tried pretty hard last year to get them, and then hopefully this year we'll get our hands on them. Um, they're coming out with kind of like this mid-range where they're not trying to be the best thing out there, they're, but they're definitely not trying to be the worst. Right. They're not trying to be your super economy lens. They're trying to be interesting. They're trying to deliver the right amount of value for the right amount of dollar. I think is what some of these companies are coming in at. One company that kind of catches my attention, and I don't, I've never used their lens. Uh, there's actually a couple of them here, but that hand division. You have any experience with those? Okay, they, we only got one of them in stock here. But what's kind of interesting? They're, they're designed in Germany. It's a German Chinese venture. Uh, they're for mirrorless cameras uh, and Micro Four Thirds, uh, Fuji X, and Leica L. Uh, they're made of anodized aluminum, brass, stainless steel construction, uh, and they're designed in Germany, manufactured in China. They have 10 iris blades, and they're interesting. They have a series. They call the – I think they – it's I-B-E-R-I-T. Yeah. I-B-R-I-T, or I-B-R-I-T, whatever. They're all F2.4, and there's a 24 millimeter, 35, 50, 75, and 90, and they're all 2.4, and they sell for between 550 and like $650. Mm-hmm. Which is really interesting, and then they make a forty, 40 millimeter f o point eight five for eighteen ninety nine. Right. But these are kind of <clears throat> going after the well, certainly like you said, the mirrorless people. Uh, they look like like a lenses, or it kind of reminds of me of what Voigtlander Cosina does. Okay. I mean, they, where you got a, 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 a you know an Asian company manufacturing German design products, mm-hmm. which is neat. Nice. I, I, yeah. But I'm looking forward to these. So they what's Leica L mount? Fuji X, Sony E, mm-hmm. and Micro Four Thirds. And most of these that we're talking about are all manual focus. I mean, yes. that Diabir, it's the Minigun Ex- Tongi. Which is one of the reasons SLR why magics. they're not expensive. Exactly. exactly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Let's jump up then to the uh, Samyang. Samyang is the the parent company, and they brand Rokinone, Bauer, Opteka, uh, ba- um, Bell & Howell, a whole bunch of other different ones. Um, and uh, I think we've all used them. They're all pretty good. All yeah. They have their place in the world, no doubt. Anyone? Definitely do. The, the the one warning I will give with those is that their focus marks aren't exactly one hundred percent. So if you're at infinity, this is where we're going back to tolerances. Where if you're at the infinity mark, you may have to go a little bit before, a little bit after to actually achieve infinity. So you have to make believe you're using a mirrorless camera with an adapter. Yeah, <laughs> it's just really what you have to do. <laughs> yeah, I was looking at a, a Ko- the Koa five hundred millimeter. Do you guys know that lens? I mean, it's not cheap. It's five hundred millimeter, but uh, and it's the only one that we sell from that brand. But they're not under the Sam Yang umbrella, but they are uh, they look pretty interesting. They look like a good lens. I, I don't know much about it. I don't see a Koa. But if anyone's, yes, K-O-W-A, it's a 500 millimeter lens. They've been around, Cow has been around forever. That's uh-huh. a very old yeah, company. I've yeah. Heard, yeah, I've not used it. I think they make bikes too. Um, but back to the Sam Yang, because it's always been a confusion for a lot of people when you see lenses that look almost exactly the same and with the same specs coming out from these different companies. Because they are the same lens. Because they are the same lens. So people should know that. And uh, I think originally they did it because the each they had specific brands going to different, different parts countries. of the world, yeah. different countries. Yeah. But now it's like yeah. just, everything's global. Well, I know, for example, here we have Rokinone, Sam Yang, Bauer. Bauer. But I think if you go to Europe, the, there's, there are brands that as Falcon, yeah. Wallamex, Polar, we have we have Wally Max. Do we? Yeah. Okay. All right. So moving on up the ladder. Um, the one the one yeah. other thing about that is that sometimes they'll release like autofocus will first come out in one of those brands. Mm-hmm. Like that's what they're doing now, and then they'll yeah. release it into other brands. So they'll come out with one lens and like their premium brand, and then right. bring it out to everyone else. And they just started doing a few autofocus lenses. I mean, within the yeah, past the year, fifty right? millimeter. Right. Right. Yeah. But they made 
I mean, I like them, you know. Good, they, good like you price. You talking about the cinema, you know, using them for cinema. Yeah. yeah. Good, right. good price. Lots of options. Now, we also have the Yasuhara lenses. If you can't focus a lens, you buy this. <laughs> <laughs> well, this it's is an now, inter- now we're talking about specialty. More this like is, this is specialty. specialty. Yeah. This is a single meniscus. It's a 100-year-old design. They basically took a 100-year-old Kodak camera, opened up the lens, saw how it was made, and then they reproduced them. And they got the Momo 100, and they got a 43-millimeter F6.4 soft focus lens. It's $179 for DSLRs. And then they make, for mirrorless lenses, a 100-millimeter... Um, no, excuse me, a 28 millimeter F64 soft focus lens, also 179. And then they make the Madoka 180 fisheye for 279, but they're all soft focus and they, they, they actually are very neat. They, they're interesting looking lenses. So soft focus was in for a while, like Nikon had a, had a soft focus lens, portrait lens um, way back which um, now I think is being reintroduced as a 135 F2 by one of the independents now. Exactly, and then you have... Um, Oh, what's their names? Lens Baby came out with the velvet, mm-hmm. and so it's it's a very. It's, once Minolta again, had a couple also, I believe, in that in that range. Yeah, there there were a few there were a few companies because there was a certain point in time. I specifically remember, like, if you take a look at stock photos from or portrait photography from, I want to say eighties, mm-hmm. you'll always see this kind of like soft focusy sure. like type of look. Wedding photography. Wedding right? photography, <laughs> exactly. Alan's specialty. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Senior photos. Exactly. Yeah. Senior photos. Like all that kind of stuff. You had this kind of soft focus type of look. And like it really it wasn't just soft focus on the background. It also was soft focus on the skin. It was it was always highlighted. So it looked dramatic and like you know it was like retouching before retouching. And what's really fascinating about it is that like this is again it's another way of getting a different look than other people are getting in camera. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So continuing with specialty, Lens Baby's been kind of the big player in that the past few years. Lomography last year or a year or so ago came out with a Petsfall. Petsfall. Um, elements in the Yasuhara, uh, the Sunex 5.6 millimeter f 5.6 super fisheye fixed focus lens. Another one out there. Um, but let's jump ahead to... I'd say a company uh, yeah. that I find interesting. Yeah. I, f- I find a lot of them. But this Mayer Optik Gorlitz. Oh, yeah. Now, that's, a, that, that's an old German name. And um, they've revised them. And they're interesting lenses. They're not inexpensive. They're made in Germany. Uh, they're made with shot glass. They have O'Hara AR coatings. I've never heard of Irish lens coatings. <laughs> um, and with, it, it interesting, they have declicked aperture rings and up to 15 iris blades. So they're taking bokeh real seriously. But they have lens, uh, a 50 0.95. That's like an Octolux. It's $3,000. A 52.9, a 5819, 7519, and a 102.8. Each of them, they all sell like $1499 to $1599.99. So they're not inexpensive, but they sound really interesting, and it sounds like they're really trying to get a real deal lens going here. Right. So we're talking the high end now. We're, we've mm-hmm. kind of jumped. Yeah. We've jumped over. You don't uh, expect one me segment. to stick to script, do you? No, no, I don't. But <laughs> uh, this is good because we should be talking about the high end now. But um, so yeah, good introduction with the Meyer Optic Orlitz. Uh Schneider, obviously a well-known name, especially in cinema, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and they, they specialize make very, in tilt shifts. Very wonderful and very expensive lenses. But uh, Zeiss is kind of the the main. Zeiss rebranded last year, yeah. pretty much. They did a really, really good yeah. job. The Milvis lenses are a nice update of the um, of ZEZF. ZEZF series lenses, which I, I used. I've owned many of them. I've used most all of them. In fact, I have used all of them. And then an opportunity to go out with uh, a couple of the new Milvis lenses a few months back, and they're really nice. There was a nice upgrade on them. Yeah, and mostly nice. mirrorless, right? No, the Milvis, the Milvis are, and the Milvis are the replica, are, are the SLR, are the okay. SLR ones. Okay. Mm-hmm. So they, and they, the Otis were SLR. Yeah. Right. yeah. And right. kind of what they've done is they've done that new housing, which they have on the Otis onto the Milvis. Right. What it also introduces is that they're able to use their focus ring. They, mm-hmm. they came out with a custom focus ring that works on their lenses, which is a really nice mm-hmm. piece. It's a $200 focus ring, wow. but um, it is really nice. And and they're still all manual focus though. Yeah. Oh, okay. And that that's until you get to Batis. Right. And do it. Batis. 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 And Voigtlander, of course. Anybody? Yeah, Voigtlander. I'm 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 a huge fan of Voigtlander, and I think what's most interesting, aside from the fact that they made some terrific, uh, like M, uh, series lenses, which they're discontinuing now. Uh, but what's really exciting about them are the new versions of their 15, 12, and 10 millimeter 
rectilinear ultra wides. Wow! I, I used the ten millimeter. I just uh, a review on it uh, some months ago, and the lens is phenomenal. It's, it's like a hundred and thirty something degree angle of view. One hundred twenty. It's, it's ridiculously These are wide. right up your alley. Oh yes, it is. But it's also <laughs> z- pretty much distortion free. It's amazing. I mean, it, it, and it's very, very sharp, especially towards the edges. If you used older v- versions of the uh, Voigtlander, say 12 and 15, which I have, the edges are always a little bit mushy, but the new Series 3, the newest versions of them are amazingly sharp right up to the corners. And they're priced well, like under a grand, which is, wow. if you think about it, go back a few years to ultra wides that were not half as good. They were a lot more money. Yeah, they they were popular. Not that they've really become repopular with with their um, with the growth of mirrorless. Yeah, and they're also made out of brass and steel. You look yeah, at this; they're small, real lenses. They're heavy. They're yeah. beautifully made. They'll they take it. So jumping ahead to what we're calling the major third party lenses, and we've spoken about them already, but we have Sigma, Tokina, and Tamron, right? And and those are the those are the major players in this, and uh, they've all put out really good lenses in the past few years. They're all yeah. stepping up their game. As we talked about earlier, they're trying to, they're having the cake and eat it too, right? I mean, yeah. having good prices and quality optics. And these are also autofocus lenses. Yeah, a couple of years ago when Sigma came out with their 35 one which is kind of the beginning of this art series, it took Canon and Nikon for a real challenge. And it came out at, I think, 899 and Canon and Nikon were both in the thirteen to $1,400 yeah. range. Yeah, And both manufacturers had to really step up. Mm-hmm. And what about the Firin? That's supposed to. That's also that. I get the impression that's like their their version of the art series lenses. They're but going after E-mount. high end. But it's email. Email. Yes, yeah. only. Which is another interesting thing. Right. Uh, there are a few of these lenses that are only available for yeah. email. Sony exactly. Email. So that's it's showing, it's showing you that Sony is really becoming a very interesting player in this market. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. The fear is, is interesting, particularly because it, it's fitting into their brand. What their brand is that they do these kind of budget. Well, I don't want to say budget, but price friendly wide angle lenses. You know, they had the eleven to sixteen for a long time, mm-hmm. two eight for APC, which APSC, which a lot of people really enjoyed. Um, and now it's a twenty millimeter, and it's really nice. I've seen photos from it; looks great. I'm interested in seeing that lens. Yeah, yeah. that I want to see. So check them out, right? I mean, who shouldn't be buying a third party lens? Who shouldn't be? Yeah. Who should not? A uh, professional under CPS or MPS is kind of like the only the only place where I can think of it. Someone who yeah. is day in day out shooting, and if God forbid something happens to their camera, they need auto auto replacement or overnight replacement. Then that would be the one person I would caution away from it. Good point. Yeah, but that's pretty narrow parameters though, because as I said, if if you're looking for budget, mid range, or high end, you're pretty much covered here in all ways. That's yeah. my take. I imagine that. There's going to be some people who are going to, you know, question that and say, if you're, you know, a sports guy or a news girl, you don't want to take any chances. Person, well, that you person, you want it, the autofocus to be as sharp and as fast as possible. Not to mention all of the compatibility. And, uh, and well, we and noticed want, the, the art lenses were fast. Now, I could, I mm-hmm. couldn't say how it compared to, uh, say, a Nikon Prime that would be equal to it or a Canon. I don't know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But it responded very nicely whenever whatever I aimed. I was getting it was happening. If you're if you're a sports shooter, none of these lenses really exist in the third party yet. You know, Sigma Sigma's tried Sigma, to make some yeah. some roads in there, but you're really shooting Canon or Nikon. Yeah. And in in that arena, because you can't be down ever. Because, that's true. Because that's your job. I mean, you want to be a part of CPS. You want to be a Canon yeah, professional person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Or, or MPS if you're on the Nikon side. And like you saw like in, like what happened in the Olympics in, in Rio. So one guy got his whole camera bag stolen and Canon right away was able to re-outfit him, you know, pretty much immediately because mm-hmm. they have a whole booth down there. They have but stuff. For your, and you, uh, need, you know, our listeners, check them out. Yeah. Well, this has been informative and entertaining. Um... Hope you guys first fuck. gear cast. Our first gear cast. I hope, this, I hope everybody's happy Thank at you, home. Jason. I, I, I want to know when I'm getting the frequent flyer miles. Yeah, you're going to let you, we're gonna let you when, know. When, when do you upgrade my seat to the first class seat? Is <laughs> okay. what I'm waiting for instead of this. You are having your card punched every time you leave here, right? <laughs> I, I try. Okay, because you need 10 punches for the upgraded chair. Oh, okay. Levy, thank you so much for stopping in again, and we look forward to having you again. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, John. Thank you, our listeners. Take a moment, go to iTunes, sign up, do a review on us. We do take them seriously. We are very interested in what you have to say. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in today. And what are your favorite lenses? Let us know. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Let us know. Let us know. Subscribe on iTunes. Check out Explora, bnh.com, Explora. 
Now, which, can you say that with a little more energy behind it? Sorry. <laughs> right. We'll get it. We'll redo it. <laughs>